In this chapter, we're going to introduce the course Labor Economics and give you kind of an overview of what's to come. Let's begin by talking about the discipline of economics in general. This is an econ class, so reminding ourselves of what economics is is going to be a good foundation. Economics is the study of how people allocate limited resources to satisfy unlimited wants. That is, how people make choices. In this sense, it becomes a study of human behavior, like many other social sciences, from sociology to anthropology to psychology and political science. We're all interested in how people make decisions and how that shows up as human behavior. But in economics, we're focused in particular on the choices people make faced with the problem of relative scarcity. We always want more than we can possibly get with the limited resources we have. And that leads people to have to face trade-offs. If we choose one thing, we give up another. For example, by choosing to take a class in economics, you may have had to choose not to take a class in some other discipline. If you use your time to go to Starbucks for coffee, you didn't use that time to go to McDonald's. There's always trade-offs, and economics is going to study uh, those relationships and the kind of thought process that people go through in making decisions. We make assumptions about people. One is relative scarcity. The other one is purposeful behavior. We assume that people are rationally self-interested. That doesn't mean that they're selfish. It just means that they behave in a way to better their situation, not worsen it. Consider yourself when you go to make breakfast. You probably decide to make something that you like and give up something that you like less. If I like Cheerios, then I'm going to make Cheerios. And if the alternative was Fruit Loops, I'll give that up. We also believe people consider the opportunity costs and benefits. So if I'm uh, making cereal, uh, Fruit Loops, or Cheerios, uh, I'm giving up Fruit Loops. Um, I'm getting the benefit of the Cheerios, I'm giving up the Fruit Loops, and I consider both of those benefits and costs in making the decision. And this is important because benefits and costs can change, and when they change, we get incentivized to make different decisions. For example, if you're going to college right now and pursuing, let's say, an economics degree, at some point you probably made that decision to allocate your resources towards an econ degree and away from something else. Well, what would that something else have been? Maybe it would have been a degree in psychology. In that case, you said the benefits of getting an econ degree outweigh the costs of getting an econ degree, which is what you give up, the psychology degree. So really, when you choose one thing, econ degree, you give up something else and that becomes your opportunity cost of what you chose. But, as I said, things can change. Let's say, for example, that you're happening, you happen to walk through the psychology department, and you notice on the wall that psychology majors are making a lot more than you thought they made. Well, now you might say, wait a minute, I made a decision to get an econ degree thinking that I was giving up a psychology degree and a lower income. But maybe now you realize that you're not. So you may change your major because it might be the case that the opportunity cost of an econ degree now is higher. So you choose a different degree program. Another assumption we make is that people pursue a net gain. This stems from benefits exceeding costs. If you did choose the econ degree and gave up the psychology degree, then really what you're saying is that you saw benefits of an econ degree greater than the costs of that econ degree, the foregone psychology degree. You saw a net gain from the econ degree. Adaptable. We assume that people are adaptable in that they will change to based on costs and benefits. I touched on that a minute ago. That's just being incentivized to make changes when circumstances change. Another thing to consider is in economics, we're studying 
fundamental questions. What to produce, how to produce, and who to produce for. I like to think of this on a desert island for simplicity. If you're alone and stranded on this island, you wake up, and you don't know why you're there, but you do know that you better answer these questions. What to produce is probably going to be food. How to produce it? Well, you could climb a coconut tree, you could go fishing, you could hunt an animal. There's many ways to do that, and you have to answer that question. Who gets it? Well, because you're the only one on the island, it's a pretty easy answer there. You get it. These questions don't go away when we move from a simple island economy to a modern industrialized nation. It's just we answer these questions with economic systems. And there's two extremes that we can think of for our purposes. On one extreme, we have market capitalism. That's where these questions are answered through voluntary exchange by buyers and sellers. The famous supply and demand model you've learned about in previous econ classes. The other extreme is centrally planned socialism. That's where we answer these questions with the political system, with a central planning body. And that would be easier to understand because what gets produced, how it gets produced, and who gets it is really at the discretion of the central planning board. Today, you can see very few centrally planned socialist systems, but the most extreme would be North Korea. So the Kim Jong-un uh, uh, dictatorship determines these the answers to these questions. Whereas in a system like Western Europe or the U.S., we rely on buyers and sellers interacting in markets to answer these three questions. The reason this is important for us is because we're studying labor economics, which is a subset of the discipline of economics. And we could study labor economics in the context of a, a system that is market capitalist or in the context of a system that is centrally planned. We're going to emphasize this here. And the reason is, is because this is now quite rare in the world. And again, this is easier to understand because if you want to know how wages are determined, uh, what people do what jobs, what industries get more labor and what industries get less. If you want to answer a lot of labor econ questions, you just look at what the leadership wants. Whereas in the market capitalist system, we're going to develop models such as the supply and demand model for labor to understand how prices or wages change for labor and why some occupations are more attractive to people than others and how some industries end up getting more labor than other industries. Another way to think about this is with what's called the circular flow model. Maybe you've seen this before. It's a simple uh, bird's eye view of the economy with only two participants. Consumers, which are the people, the households, and we assume that they own all the resources, including their time, labor. And then over here we have producers. These are the firms, the businesses. The way an economy works in market capitalism is we, the consumers, the households, the workers, we supply our, our labor, our resources to producers who then mix those resources up and make goods and services that we buy. So maybe you go to work at Walmart and contribute to the production of everything on its shelves, but then you go and you get those goods from Walmarts as a buyer. You're a supplier of labor resource and you become a buyer, demander of goods and services. Notice the roles are reversed for the producers. They are the buyers of resources and the sellers of goods and services. So different roles, but important in the bigger scheme of allocating our resources to get goods and services that we want. Keep this model in mind throughout the course, because what we're really doing here is looking at this particular allocation of resources here. When consumers, households, individuals, we take our resources and we make them available to firms, one of those markets is the labor market. And we'll study that in this class. And it, 
There's other markets. So there's real estate markets where we take our land and make it available to firms. There's financial markets where we take our financial capital, our, our money, and we make it available to firms. In the bigger picture, though, it's just the owners of resources supplying them to firms to produce the goods and services that we then enjoy. It's more nuanced than that because if we were to look at the labor market down here, we could further look at the labor market for specific occupations or for specific areas of the country. If San Diego has a different labor market than maybe, you know, a, a labor market in Miami or in New York or Dallas. So we'll get into some of those nuances in the course, but always keep in mind this bird's eye view. In labor economics, we're studying this flow of resources, human time, over to businesses. So businesses can partner those with other resources and provide us all the goods and services that we enjoy. Labor economics studies the organization functioning and outcomes of labor markets. It's going to have both micro and macro components. So we get a little bit of both. However, because we're building from the most basic level up, our emphasis is going to be on micro. We want to know how individuals make the decision to supply their labor and become workers in that labor market. We also want to know how businesses make that employment decision and become demanders, buyers of labor in that labor market. So we're really starting at the most fundamental level of the economy. But later on in the course, we'll talk about some macro components like unemployment, labor force participation, and um, labor productivity, among others. The thing about labor economics is it's both relevant and controversial. One of the reasons I like this class so much is because even though we're going to be building models and doing you know, some analytical uh, exercises, we can apply those to the real world. And it's particularly beneficial for uh, college students, uh, seniors in, in particular, because you're about to graduate and go into labor markets. Some of you are already there, and it's nice to know how labor markets work so you can make the best decisions with your degree and align with the long-term opportunities that you want to achieve. It's relevant in part because of its quantitative importance. 70% of all national income goes to labor. That may be surprising, but remember, there are other resources going to, to firms. So you can think of it like this. When households make their uh, land available, they get rent as income. When we make our financial capital available, we get things like interest rates or dividends uh, from the firms. That's how they pay us for that financial capital. And when we make available our labor, they provide us a wage, along with other types of compensation, such as fringe benefits, bonuses, commissions, all sorts of things. But the point is, firms have to pay for that labor. And it's one of many resources that they're having to pay to get to, to do business. The majority of that payment is in the form of wages and compensation to labor. That leaves 30% that goes really to the suppliers of land, to the suppliers of financial capital, and to the profits that are accrued to the owners of the business. Labor also has unique characteristics. The demand for labor along with all other resources, is derived from the product it produces. The reason there's demand for construction workers is because there's a demand for houses. The reason there's demand for agricultural workers is because there is demand for fruits and vegetables. Labor is rented, not purchased. Unlike land and financial capital, which the business can actually buy and own, possess to the exclusion of others, labor isn't like that. We don't allow human beings to be owned anymore, and as a result, you're simply borrowing their time and paying them a wage if you're in business. Labor also has non-pecuniary, non-monetary elements, and that means that the job itself 
has a lot to do with whether people want to work or not. We'll talk more about that in the next video.